Yeah. So what were the things that you thought were interesting that Sal was saying that you wanted to talk about? Well, so the debate was on evolution and um, the good, the good, the nice part about that debate was that the pro evolution guys were, I I don't know what you think, Sal, but I found them very um, intelligent and and especially very kind. I, I didn't even, even, with respect to your partner, I thought they were, you know, much kinder than I would have been. <laughs> um, and I and I thought they, you know, they 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 knew a little bit about what what they were talking about, but they weren't. They clearly were not scientists, and they certainly weren't biologists. So, you were making some points that I think were way over their head. Um, but there, I, some of those points I thought were really good and. W- what I mentioned before when, when we first got on was that I've been thinking a lot about uh, biology and, and the talk that I gave in Houston was all based on the idea that even though I hold to evolution and I'm, you know, I'm not going to give it up, I think that the theory of evolution is incomplete. And in fact, what's wrong with one of the things that's wrong with it is it's not a very good theory of biology. So if you ask most biologists, especially, I wouldn't say atheist or not, doesn't really matter in this case. Most biologists are going to tell you that everything that you have a question about in biology can be answered by evolutionary theory. And you pointed out several examples where that's not true, and and you were correct. I mean, I agree with that. <laughs> it doesn't mean you were correct. Oh, you. I, I agree with those, you know. Um, and in fact, there are many such, and it's and and many biologists who are not evolutionary biologists, but especially physiologists and other biologists are coming, and not theists, by the way, are coming up with the same points. And uh, the more I read about this um, and the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that the real issue is not even evolution. It's kind of a side issue in a way. The real issue is that biology as a whole doesn't have a theory. It doesn't have a coherent, comprehensive theory that can explain a large number of things and one of those one of those of course is the origin of life and and there's no question about that because the only time you get evolution is when you have living cells with all of the mechanisms that living cells use like reproduction and you know all all the all those biological mechanisms are required for evolution so the theory can't possibly explain the origin of life, but that's okay. So that put that aside because most biologists will ad- admit that, will agree to that, and they come up with all kinds of different scenarios which we don't have to talk about because I think the three of us are in complete agreement when it comes to origin of life. But even within life itself, you <clears throat> you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe I believe you mentioned. Um, the the issue of the origin of eukaryotes is that is that right you remember that Sal? yes I, yes yeah. and you're right i mean the issue the origin of eukaryotes the origin of multicellular organisms not only are not explained by evolution they kind of contradict it and and just to use that and I'm again. I'm speaking as someone who agrees with the general theory that it that it's correct, but it's it it doesn't explain huge huge things. So, for example, you know, one of the things in in with with the origin of multicellularity is cells, which up until then were individual actors in the struggle for existence, right? I mean, so if a particular cell had a mutation that allowed it to do something better, it would it would be selected for. It would survive, you know, according to standard Darwinian 
theory, right? But as soon as it becomes part of an organism, that competition has to stop. <laughs> it, it can no longer behave. It can no longer behave as if it is in competition with all its neighboring cells in the organ, in the organism. How does that happen? And now the, the whole, quote, struggle for survival, whatever you want to call it, the whole competitive uh, selective race is no longer between the cells. It's between the whole organism, the collection of cells. And that is a mystery that nobody has even begun to approach <laughs> because we, we have no idea how that could happen. That's just a couple of examples, and there are others. And, of course, I, I always bring up the example of human beings. I mean, we, what we're doing right now is not explainable by any theory of biological evolution, right? So, uh, so there's obviously big holes. And what I've been reading about, sorry I'm talking so much, but I'll stop in a few minutes. It's sort of an introduction, and then you guys jump in. What I've been reading about is, um, for example, Dennis Noble, who is not a theist, but is a very good theologist, and a guy named, who, when I gave the talk, you remember, Rebecca, uh, a guy named Seth Hart, young guy who gave another talk? When I gave my talk, he, he came over to me and said, you have to read somebody named Scott Turner, J. Scott Turner, who I'd never heard of. And he's written a few books. And the reason he told me to read him is because he's saying what I'm saying, or I'm saying what he's saying. And what he's pointing out is that what's missing in evolution is teleology, okay? And what he says is, which, and that's, that's the other thing. Oh, that's the, I forgot that this is important. The other thing that makes it, really tough to call evolutionary a complete theory, evolution a complete theory, is that it's based on fitness, right? Relative fitness. But fitness has no definition. And that, that everybody knows, everybody admits that. That's the definition of fitness is the tautology. Those creatures that are, uh, that tend to survive more are more fit. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, um, that's oh, oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you're fitter, you survive. Well, you survive because you're fitter. I mean, it's it, we, we we had we had the struggle like a year and a half to get a paper through just to point that out, and the really? editor almost canceled it. We got it in a Springer Nature chapter, and it, it, all we had to, were doing was collecting what uh, population geneticists themselves said. We didn't actually add anything new. This was a reference work, but it shocked the editor so much because it was in a mathematical journal, not a biology journal. Right. He, he almost rejected it. <laughs> Somehow we got it through. And it's like, well, there's no reason that he wouldn't, he wouldn't let it through because this wasn't a research article. It was a reference work. So we just collected what was there and exactly what you said. And we, you know, even at, we had, we had an award-winning mathematician and population geneticist from Sweden as a co-author, we had John Sanford, he had myself, and then Bill Basner is the lead author. There was nothing that should be controversial, but it was just written by people that, you know, it was really who the authors were that were kind of, people had issues with, you know, me and John Sanford are more well known for, you know, kind of our views. But it's exactly, it's really great hearing that come out of your, you know, come out of you saying that. I appreciate that. And Rebecca is going to get a laugh here because Sai, you've said some really kind things uh, because Jay Bundy is just saying I'm terrible. <laughs> you're you're a lot better than he is. So coming from you, and you're a professor at my school. I was a student. You're a professor there. That I can't tell you how much it means that you listened and said we have to talk. So that's uh, thank you. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, look, uh, Sal. We've known each other for a while, and you know, I I. We disagreed a couple of times, you know, even on uh, on air, I guess, uh, or at least on on some discussions. But I've always respected you, as you know, and uh, you know. So I was, and, and I, I guess, I guess what I'm what I'm coming at is that 
you know, this this whole it, I, I kind of feel like we're arguing about the wrong thing when we argue about, you know, common descent and, and all the standard evolutionary stuff, because it first of all, it doesn't really matter that much it, it, compared to the real issue. And to me, the real issue is we're not going anywhere in biology right now. I mean, we're, we're, we're making some, we're still going to make, you know, molecular biological progress. People will find more pathways and more, you know, if you re, there's plenty of literature coming out every day about some very detailed stuff, right? But the really, the really important questions are not being addressed. And it's shocking to me, frankly, to hear that you had trouble with that paper by saying that the definition of fitness is a tautology. Because if you look at Wikipedia, it says it right there. You look up the price equation, which is not really, you know, the price equation, which is supposed to be the mathematical treatment of natural selection. In the Wikipedia article, it says this is not a natural, this is not a theoretical equation. It's just explaining the tautology of, of natural selection. This is well known. We can't define fitness because it's constantly different. So here is, I think, one of the roots of the problems. If we're going to talk about a general theory of biology and we want to use fitness, let's say we want to use something related to evolution. And, you know, and, and in fact, the other, the other thing here is that one of the reasons I don't think it's worth arguing about, about the general idea is because, you know, many young earth creationists, including AIG, will accept a certain amount of common descent and natural selection based evolution from the family down. Right. I mean, I don't know if you follow that, but generally, I mean, AIG has, has a, uh, a, um, a, gra a graph, which I always show showing, you know, the evolution of cats from the original cat kind that was on the ark. And then after the ark landed, there's a, dis there's a dispersion of, all the species that arose from that cat kind through some form of evolution. So it's not, it's not that process that's in, that's in question. What's in question are more details of when does it start? And some of the things that Sanford brings up, for example, the issue of, of, uh, of loss of information and thing, you know, genetic entropy, that kind of thing. Okay, so those things can be discussed, but to me, the the key, the, the really important part is we're talking about we're talking about a theory that is probably going to be discarded entirely in the next several years. Well, maybe take longer than that, but at some point it's 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 going to become antiquated. There'll still be some surviving remnants of it because natural selection probably occurs. But there's going to have to be another theory that replaces it that would include, among other things, the definition of fitness. And what I'm coming at is that, and, and I think I, I haven't finished his book yet, but this guy, uh, Scott Turner, is saying the same thing. We have to take into account purpose and agency. Because one of the things that happens in biology is that every living organism has, has a purpose, which could be as simple as to survive, or it could be more complex, and it acts. Agent, I mean, bacteria act, right? Every living organism, every plant, every animal acts on its own. It's not simply the... It, 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 things don't happen to it because of outside physical chemical forces only. There are, you know, there is energy coming in. There are forces acting on the organism, but the organism itself acts. It has agency and nothing, nothing that's not alive does. Okay. No, no volcano says, gee, I think I'll blow up today. I'm in the mood. You know, it, it has no role in whether it's going to uh, and whether it's going to erupt. That's due to forces and pressures and whatever. It has nothing to say about it. Neither does a storm, neither does a fire, 
neither does a rock, neither does a planet or a galaxy. They are all passive recipients of outside forces. Living systems are also recipients of outside forces, but they have, they act with a will. They act for a purpose. And that's not nowhere in biology. Have you ever seen that in any biological discussion, a textbook or a paper? No. And it's the key, it's critical. It's the key. Well, actually, you know, what happens a lot is they do use the teleological language. Like if you watch any documentary about nature, they have to talk about nature as if it's an agent, you know, as if it's um, nature has a way of doing this. Nature has designed such and such to do this nature. And so they, they repeatedly, you know, and they can't avoid it. And in fact, I've even heard like Richard Dawkins talk about this, like, well, we have to use that language, but we have to remember that it's not, you know, it, there is no agent there. There's no, you know, <laughs> exactly. And that's so silly. I mean, you, we even said, you know, the function of this enzyme is to do this. Well, the function, the function, it means purpose. The reason it exists is, is to, is to catalyze this reaction. So, and, and what you said is absolutely right. I mean, the language has to be teleological, teleological because there's no other way to talk about life. <laughs> and, and there are people who go out of the way and say, it's a mistake. I read this somewhere. It's a mistake to say that the turtle came ashore to lay its eggs because that implies purpose. So you have to say the turtle came ashore and laid its eggs. <laughs> um, just, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, I don't actually recall that we ever disagreed on air. Um, it might have been some of my colleagues that are very uh, much more polemic. I'm not. Um, and um, oh, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just want to say that's true. I, you're right. I don't think it was you. I, well, I'll tell you why, because I keep, I actually, I'll tell you why it's unlikely and, and, and in general, uh, I, and I get a lot of flack from young earth creationists. I said, and it was even in my debate, I said, let's assume common ancestry. And, and, and it's like, they're, they're like, wow, that was a big concession. It's like, well, it's going to be easier now because they said, let's just start common ancestry. We have someone like Michael Behe that accepts common ancestry, right. and then I could even cite individuals like yourself and say, now, what is the real problem? It's the complication. It's uh, Darwin, Origin of Species, Chapter 6, Organs of Extreme Perfection and Complication. And then we can also talk about uh, teleology. But so I was just thinking, because I before I got into biology, I was in the aerospace and defense industry. And uh, there's just purpose written all. In fact, we codify the purpose of things. So like a really good example that corresponds in human affairs and in biology is like a thermostat. Uh, so there's temperature regulation. It's like, well, this is set up to, to regulate temperature. If you don't use that language, it starts to like be too awkward and just not make sense at all. Uh, <laughs> You can't describe the system adequately if you don't use, say, temperature control. And when you have control, that means it's it's designed for a purpose. So I could say the, the temperature control of humans is to maintain about 98.6. And if you don't state it that way, you're not really doing very good biology. You can't run away from it. Yeah, that that that's exactly exactly what I agree with. I mean, I, I, I think and in fact, this book that I'm reading by by uh, uh, Turner starts out with homeostasis <laughs> as you know as as the the definition of of um how animals you know how creatures differ from non-creatures i mean it's you know they, they regulate they regulate themselves temperature uh hunger i mean all kinds of systems are and they're very complex systems that do this regulation they're not simple oh you yeah know, Exactly. Because, well, what ended up happening, and I actually saw this, 
in engineering, electrical engineering, we have these control systems. So like a disk drive will position things in the right place. And that's what they call control theory. And then that extends to making missiles and things, you know, anything that is, uh, uh, is semi-autonomous or autonomous where it could just move and locate and adjust. So like, uh, say we have, I'm sorry to use the term missile. I prefer I had non-warfare examples, but that's where we actually have a lot of high technology is so a, a missile will guide to the target and if there's changes in wind or atmosphere it's just going to readjust because it has a goal and we have to build these incredibly difficult mathematical models and then impose it into the missile construct it so that you know we need a lot of math for that and when i saw they started to use these control feedback circuits. And then I started to see the same circuits in gene regulation. And they had to actually get in electric, you know, engineers to import it there and say, now we recognize, oh, you know, uh, this is, this describes this feedback circuit and we are able to classify it, but that didn't come from biology. That came, that was imported from the engineers. And, and then, um, so that's, uh, that's what I began seeing and uh, I don't know how I, oh, now I know what, how I got on that tangent. I specifically remember in my debate, something that I said, and you said, Sal, we need to talk. It was when we were talking about the ERVs. And I said, there's been a, there's been a revolution in the ERV understanding of it. And I started pointing out this could be applying to all sorts of transposons in the genome. But I said, the ERV, you have these zinc finger cap one complexes. They're, they're important for um, being specific locations where these molecular machines would assemble and start modifying the chromatin. And this, th this can alter the 4D nucleome. And we have now, we know that these expressed um, RNAs form these membraneless organelles. And I was just like, yeah, this is gonna fly over everyone's head. But you came through and said, Sal, we have to talk. And I knew it would resonate with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing that, I mean, people, when people, when biologists, I'm talking about standard biologists now, okay? When they see that kind of thing, they will say, well, yeah, that's amazing what natural selection and evolution can do. Which, you know, in some cases might be true, but sometimes the, the um, degree of complexity and the degree of, how do I put this? Uh, the, 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 it's not just complexity. It's, it's, you know, if you look at any, if you look at any, even a metabolic system, you know, to, to make whatever uh, nucleotides, and if you look at the details of it and the control of the metabolic system, it's practically fractal. It, it just keeps, the deeper you go, the more levels of complexity you find. So you don't have a simple system where you have a signal and a feedback. And once you get the product high enough, the feedback shuts off the system. That, that would be a good control system, right? Like a, a, a heating thermostat right. in the house. It's so much more complicated than that because then you have another system that also turns it on and another system that turns it both off and turns off the thing that turns it on and another system that turns on the thing that turns it on. And, and this goes on and on and on. And, okay, so the only answer for that you could say is, well, these are these are these these extra systems are there because natural selection picked them because they prevent a disaster. It's like it's like um, um, what would it, what would you call it? Uh, fail safe. Okay, so you have a system and then you add on to it a, a fail safe system to make sure that if that fails, something else comes in instead. And then you have three or four more fail safe systems. And the question is, well, these failure failures are very rare. So if you have, if just thinking logically, if you have a selection because you've got a fail-safe system, I could see how one 
might be better than having none, right? So that animal might, or that cell or whatever might do better. But if you have five or six, that's overkill. You're never going to get to the point where there are two organisms. One of them has lost five fail-safe systems and the other one has a sixth and it survives. That's not going to happen. <laughs> well, and There's isn't something it, else going on. Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, sorry. Isn't it like with the zinc finger protein, sorry, um, it like it's like a kind of a combination lock, sort of like you've got to have all these things like ordered properly. And it's if I compare it and I'm a person with agency, look, if I could like, you know, save my life or save the world by opening like a, a, a combination lock, right? It, it, then if I don't have the code, it's not going to help me. It doesn't matter what's in there. If I don't have the code, there is no way I'm getting in there. And that's me as an agent with intelligence trying. I can sit there and try, 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 but I'm not going to be able to do that. How much less can something without agency, right, suddenly have the right combination for what's needed? Um, and so uh, natural selection does not explain this because you've got to have the ability first to be able to select from. So that's that's the key thing that you that you just pointed out is the issue of natural selection. Um as being absolutely free of agency. In other words, that natural selection, the general idea in biology since the 1940s has been that mutations occur randomly. And if, if an organism is lucky, it gets a mutation that helps it out. Let's say opens the lock, okay? And then that organism survives. So the idea is to exclude any agency at all. It's all due to either random or perhaps chemical forces that act and do something. But, you know, we already know that's not true. And this also I got from, from Dennis Noble because, and, and even before that, when I, was, when I was doing my own research, mostly in cancer research, I learned about error-prone repair. So the point is, that error-prone repair is, is very interesting. When I was working in research, and I guess it was in the 80s, um, it first was discovered to be very important in bacteria. And what it is, is you get DNA damage, and there are enzymes which repair the DNA when it's damaged, okay? But in some circumstances, when a cell is badly damaged, the repair is on purpose makes errors. In other words, it makes more mutations than it would normally do. And the reason is to increase the mutation rate. Because if you have a bunch of bacteria and they're surrounded with a toxin or they're starving or some, there's some really, they're, they're all going to get wiped out. They will start repairing their DNA damage in a way that increases the mutation rate. So you know, that's going to cause a huge amount of death. And most of the bacteria will die. But when the mutation rate is that high, you get a few rare mutants. And that will actually overcome the, the toxic agent, antibiotic or whatever it is. And those few survivors will repopulate the colony. Okay. That's pretty smart strategy. This is done by almost all bacteria. And it's, it's agency. And not only that, but often, and this has only been discovered in the last decade or so, often the location of the mutation will be selected. So you'll get a hypermutation in a specific region of the genome, which happens to coincide with where the genes that might help exist. This is called stress-directed mutation. And it's been demonstrated by a number of people. One of the leaders is uh, Susan Rosenberg, who I actually met once. She came to NIH South to give a talk. And, <laughs> and I talked to her. Um, this is a real phenomenon. And 
it's astounding because what we're saying is bacteria, okay, now I'm not talking about people, bacteria are able to act with this agency to survive. Now, you could probably make a case maybe that that comes from natural selection, but that's a tough case to make because you're, what, you're, what you're looking at, what I think we're looking at when we see things like that is what this, uh, this guy, Scott Turner, writes in his book is, is desire. <laughs> now, this sounds really weird, but that's the title of his book. The organisms want to do something. They desire it. I call it they have a purpose to do it. And they have the agency to do it. So they have the agency to do this purpose. And the purpose is to live, is to survive. And I, 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 that has to be built into the fabric of the original life form. Because if it weren't, we would never have gotten the kind of life that we see in Luca or, or the, the simplest possible organism that we can imagine. So. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't quite that familiar with, um, I mean, I, I knew about it, but I didn't know the terms. So error prone mutation and then stress induced mutation from an engineering standpoint, we would call those last resort measures. It's like, it wouldn't be the primary mode of operation. This is something you would do when you have, when you have nothing to lose. And so even in the medical profession, there are like, well, we might be able to save this person's life, but we're going to use a really dangerous drug. And so uh, it, it's, it's almost like these, these very measured responses to, to managing the genome. Uh, I mean, a good example is chemotherapy. That's like the last thing you want to do. And you're just gonna just go out there and just start blowing out cells, and it's like this is this is the last resort. We know, and I only learned this recently, and I'm embarrassed to say it, um, because I worked with Joe Deweese on topo isomerases, and it, it's been great publishing with him, and I expect we'll continue to publish. He said one of the problems with topo isomerases is it induces new cancers. Uh, so when we try to, you know, that's one thing he said, that's one of the side effects. When we're trying to kill a cancer, you might actually create more. But when you're in a situation, you're going to, that if you don't do something, the uh, the individual is going to die anyway. It's like, no, now, now is the, this is the, this is, we've satisfied the uh, kind of the decision matrix to start using last resort measures. And I, as you're describing this, this is exactly what I, what I would expect where uh, 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 we would start having these uh, these kind of be, um, behaviors um, in the genome. It's like uh, normally that would not be the case, but when it comes to like high stress environments and there's nothing to lose at that point, somehow the bacteria has that decision matrix and it's saying, well, the colony is probably gonna die anyway we might, you know, there, there's nothing really to lose and something possibly to gain by going into stress-induced mutation because um, I needed, there was a paper by Lenski and it it has just kind of like been buried in all the stuff about Lenski's long-term experiment. It is the mutator genomes, they, there is, the genome decays despite fitness gains, the genomes decay despite fitness gains. And it's like, well, that's what I would expect in a high stress environment. And what ends up happening in these situations, the, the bacteria lose versatility. And so this is like a, uh, and I've seen this in engineering where we are trying to make an airplane. And if you want to make an airplane fly high and fast, you just dump all the equipment. But then it's not very versatile to operate in other environments. It becomes very fragile, where it's like a hiker that uh, is is going around and he's just, he's like, well, I think I want to move faster. So I'm going to dump all my winter gear. And then he encounters a cold environment. And that's exactly what we see. And I saw it. You can actually see these diagrams. You call them pan genome diagrams where they take the E. coli and said, okay, let's see what's conserved. And you see only 20% is conserved. So a lot of times the, the bacteria would actually, because they have horizontal gene transfer, a lot of times they're just going to dump a lot of function actually lose a lot of genes. They're, they're often operating with 
somewhat minimal genomes than the whole genomic set that's out there. And um, <clears throat> in Lenski's experiment, that was confirmed that uh, it was it was losing stuff. And unless there's horizontal gene transfer, these these genes are um, they're, they're they're irreversibly lost. But that is a uh, that is like a last ditch. It's a last resort survival strategy. So thank thank you for putting that example out. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, it. The interesting thing about it is that it works. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's that's how bacteria survive, and that's that's why you know if you don't pound them with a, a, a two weeks of antibiotic, you'll get sick again. Because if you just take, you know, a few days of antibiotic, they go through that process and they're fine because they're resistant to the antibiotic. And, you know, this is, this is, um, it, it not only works in, in, in life, in life, I mean, it not only works, uh, you know, in, in experiments, like, you know, you're describing Lenski's experiment, but it also works theoretically. And that's because I've been working on this whole issue of mutation and um, and the origin of life and how you can you know how you can get uh, uh, depending on the mutation rate, which is the rever the converse of fidelity of replication, right? So in other words, if fidelity is low, it means it's a high mutation rate. So I was I published a uh two papers on that and i and then it dawned on me well wait a minute what i'm saying is that that um that a high mutation rate is always uh bad right it's always going to kill the the animal and how does that fit with this hypermutation thing so i did another uh set of uh simulations i, I i'm not doing any experiments i don't have a lab but i i'm doing this in computer simulations and it turns out that it works theoretically as well. This hypermutation thing actually explains bacterial survival if you just do it purely hypothetically. And that I wrote that up, and that's it's now under review. So I, hopefully it'll get published. But what I'm what I'm saying is is that you know these systems which happen which which are widespread throughout the bacterial world the single cell world prokaryotic world um yeah maybe they evolved but it is absolutely unclear how that could have happened in in the way that we usually think of natural selection working so so basically what i'm getting to the general idea is you know yeah i i don't think there's in my view, you know, in my own view, as, as an evolutionary creationist, I'm not saying that evolution is wrong. And, and I, I set, made that very clear when I gave my talk in Houston. But I am saying that it's not enough. It's not complete. And, you know, it's, it's sort of beside the point, I think. I know I, this may be really foolish, but I think that at some point we're going to have to face the fact, we meaning all biologists are going to have to face the fact that we're pretty much in the same position that physics was, you know, before Einstein came up with relativity. I mean, nobody could explain how the speed of light could be a constant. Didn't make sense. Nobody knew what light was. Nobody knew why there was no ether. These were all little nagging problems right and then it turned out they had a lot of things wrong <laughs> and you know it was it was relativity and quantum theory that came around and and using whole new approaches that that solved it and now we have modern physics well we're in the same place in biology you know we're we're kind of stuck i mean nothing the general overall theory in biology has not changed since 1970. There was a big change in 1970 when I first started graduate school. That tells you how old I am. Uh, there was a big change because in 1970, the, the uh, retro uh, uh, retroviruses were discovered, right? So that meant 
that there are RNA viruses that actually make DNA. So the central dogma, which was DNA makes RNA makes protein, had to be revised with an arrow going from RNA back to DNA. That was a big revolution. <laughs> and two, two, two guys got the Nobel Prize for that. But that's a very minor change compared to what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm talking about a whole different way of looking at biology, bringing back maybe even bringing back vital force. I mean, there's something going on that we don't know what it is. And mm -hmm. what I think is would be really good, and, and, I, and again, I'm seeing this from lots of folks. Um, James Shapiro has been talking about this for years, about, you know, natural genetic engineering as opposed to natural selection. And, uh, and, and as I said, Dennis Noble is... is beating this drum and the whole extended evolutionary synthesis is sort of heading in that direction slowly. And we have this uh, hard line neo-Darwinians who just think all of it is crazy and they think it's woo and mystical and religious and, you know, and they, and they, you know, Jerry Coyne being the best example of that type. And, um, they're not taking it seriously, any of this stuff seriously. And they're stuck in this paradigm, which is random, you know, no room for anything like agency or teleology in science. So rule it out and not able or willing to see that biology is different. It's not just complicated chemistry. It's different. There's something special about biology and, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I, that's, that's what I wanted to talk to. I wanted to tell you how I feel about this and, you know, get you thinking about it. I think you already are thinking about it and uh, spread it. You know, we need to talk to a lot of people and uh, see if we can make any progress. Oh, I, I, I very much appreciate that. I'm going to give you some data points of what I've studied and, uh, my feeling is actually, and this has medical significance, so uh, uh, given that I work for Dr. Sanford, you could probably get what my angle is, is that uh, we actually, with the Lenske experiment where fit, fitness is increasing, but we're losing versatility, uh, we can extrapolate that to the human genome. There's, I, I asked Dr. Dan in, in the debate, uh, can you name one major geneticist thinks our genome's improving. And I don't remember that he gave a very clear answer, but I, I said, I don't know of any, that natural selection is actually going to, uh, some people have been saying natural selection has contributed to our decay of intelligence. And so my view is um, obviously creationist, but let's say that even if we don't be a hardline creationist, let's say there may have been something in the past that gave us the complexity we have now, but now the complexity is decaying. That is, from a scientific standpoint, it's sadly, a, it's, a predict, it's a prediction that can be borne out if our genomes decay. And the thing that has struck me is geneticists like Brian Sykes at Oxford saying, we're, you know, we don't have very long as, as a species at the, at the rate of our decay. And then Michael Lynch. And and you know, John, uh, Dr. Sanford, um, I he, he insist I call him John, so I'll call him John in this talk. John would just say, "Yes, yeah, I'll." Uh, I'd pass this on to him uh, as I'm doing kind of when I was working for him, and he'd say, "Yeah, it's amazing that Michael Lynch and I seem to come to the same conclusions about the destiny of the human genome, and then same with so so many others." And since the NIH is very concerned about heritable disease, uh, we're going to be knowing the state of our genome as time progresses. So now when you mention this, what I, the stress-induced mutation, we see a lot of that in bacteria. I'm going to give you a data point that's kind of unique to <clears throat> uh, papers Joe DeWeese and I published. And I did the study of post-translational modifications on the topoi summary C-terminal domain. And I said, hey, Joe, look. So I, he said, look at all these creatures, Sal. And, you know, we start off with yeast and, 
and uh, we would do Aerodopsis thaliana, you know, the whatever tail crest or whatever. And then uh, we put in a chicken and a monkey, uh, a chimpanzee, and then a human. And I said, Joe, uh, the human has verified like something like one or 200 post-translational modifications on the C-terminal domain. I'm just like, this thing's like the, it's like every, you know, every third amino acid position has had a recorded possible post-translational modification. We went to yeast and it only had like five. Now, either we didn't detect it or that's the way it is. And, and I said, uh, and then we had some discussions and I said, Joe, look, we could take human, we can take human topoisomerases. We have a number of paralogs like topoisomerase alpha, topoisomerase beta. You put that in yeast, the yeast didn't care whether it was alpha or beta, it lived. We have um, indirect evidence that the reverse is not, is not true. You can't take a yeast and put it in a human. Now, the way we verify that, because it's unethical to genetical genetic engineer a human with such experiments. We did it with mice because the mice have a topo A, topo B. And um, when we knocked out the mice, topo alpha, it died or had severe complications. And then if we knocked out the beta and let only the alpha, it had it either died or had severe complications. But the yeast didn't seem to care. And I said, Joe, you know, it seems uh, you know, for the very complex, if we view ourselves as being complex and special, which is some evolutionary biologists don't really like that language, but if we are special, I can, I could see it even at the level of individual proteins. We have, we have probably more, uh, I guess, like kinases and all these other post-translational machinery than any other creature. Uh, so, so this last resort mutation that you're talking about in bacteria, that, that'll work for them. But humans are extremely sensitive to mutation. That was the takeaway. I, we're not going to get away with what happens in the bacterial world. And I'm just throwing that out there that um, we have, I don't think we can extrapolate what we see in the bacterial world because if we have, if we have that, uh, you know, if we have kind of the behavior stress-induced mutations for creatures as complex as humans, uh, I think we have experimental evidence and theoretical evidence. It's just not going to work as a strategy because yeah. of the sensitivity, just like with all the post-translational. I mean, these uh, humans are just so complex. And I was just like, wow, that sounds kind of heretical to say that our the way our proteins work is just orders of magnitude more complicated than the, than like, say, the unicellular yeast. But I could actually see it. I cataloged it, and thank God we got it published. And uh, people were like, "Wow, that's pretty interesting." Yeah, no, the the um, those error prone enzymes are not in humans. You're right; they're not. We, we don't we don't have them. I don't know. I don't think they're in mammals. I think they they're basically prokaryotic for exactly the reason you said. It would it would wreak havoc. It wouldn't work. <laughs> um, I didn't but know what, that. That's a great data point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, that, yeah. It, um, but let me ask you. So when you so when you say that the number of because I didn't know about this, the number of post translational modifications in human is is far higher than it is in yeast. You, yeah. you mentioned okay for the specific enzyme for for the specific topoisomerase, oh, 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 oh. but this is a testable prediction. Right. That, that would be the case for in general. And one of the bases of that is a lot of our genome are genes that do post translational modifications. That's the first thing. And and so this is an this is just kind of it was an interesting hypothesis that I just never had time to. And you we, we would need a we would need a big team of bioinformaticists to look at this. But that is actually the reason I think I'm very concerned about the human genome is like we are very, very fragile. We are not like bacteria. And, and of course, doc, that, that would be consistent with kind of Dr. Sanford's view uh, about 
the fragility of our the human genome and that we're deteriorating and you know i think you and i and rebecca would agree with this he said our our hope isn't in re-engineering our genome or anything else our, our hope is in is in jesus <laughs> you mean, and you know that's the one thing we can all agree on yeah, I, I, I absolutely. Uh, oh, I don't think it's the only thing. I think there's a few other things too, but that's that's the main thing. Uh, but okay, so you know, I mean, again, this whole issue of the genome raises an entirely different issue, which I haven't mentioned yet. But that's this whole question of information and. Uh, how is it that organisms deal with, actually, Rebecca said something like this, you know, that if the information is, is, is not there, if you don't, if you don't have the code to unlock the, the bicycle lock, right. Or whatever it is, how do you get that code? And, and that's a question that is also, um, has fallen outside of any clear explanation based on evolution because for example the genetic code which is you know universal with a few extra little modifications but it's basically universal and so how did it how do you evolve a code it's very hard to do that because once once you have some kind of a code changing it is extremely difficult and in fact, the little variations that exist are very minor. You know, the tryptophan ends up being a stop codon, that kind of thing. Um, so, so the, the the as far as I know, the major theory is that it didn't evolve. It was just an accident. You know, it, it was somehow an accident. Okay, so GGG ended up coding for glycine by chance, and etc and all the codons just you know but that doesn't answer the question how did we get this whole concept of information going in the first place and the other thing about it is i i have a friend who's a, a pretty well-known biologist who published a paper many years ago he worked on evolution of the genetic code his name's steve freeland and he found he and his group found that um the current genetic code the, the canonical genetic code that we have they did work to determine how good is it in terms of avoiding you know harmful mutations avoiding all kinds of problems it's way way over in the top i don't know 0.01 percent of all possible codes so you wouldn't expect that to come at random <laughs> There had exactly. to be some, what's that? Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, there had to be some tuning, some fine tuning. And, 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 and that's, you can't figure out how, because you can't fine tune the genetic code. Once you have a code, if you got a random code to start with, it's not going to change because you have to change every tRNA, every, you know, uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase, all the, all the components that, that make the code work, you know, to make proteins that's not easy to do. That's a huge, you have to change lots of things at once. And not only that, but you have error correctors that right. prevent you from developing new code. Right. And exactly. so you, and, but those have to be part of the code in the first place. That's right. In order to even get them. That's right. Exactly. So, so this is a whole additional, <laughs> set of problems you know now it, it's related to origin of life obviously but um you know there's just there's just no simple or clear definitive explanation for any of this and i think uh, at some point you know i i'm not going to say we have to bring god in because we're not up to that yet we're not ready for that yet and we may never we may not be we may never be for a while but we're going to have to bring something into it and uh because what what we've got now doesn't doesn't cut it well you know i, I got to say that i i 
you know my position on this, but it, I'm still appreciative that we keep trying. And so I, I remember when Michael Behe was at a book signing on Edge Evolution, and they say, well, okay, so if you believe in intelligent design or God did it, what sort of experiments would you like biology to do then? Are you just going to give up? He said, no, I actually like Lenski's experiments because I'm predicting they're not going to solve the problem. And he said, I actually like the fact that the scientists are going to keep trying because this is actually a testable hypothesis that we can keep coming up with theories and experiments and it'll justify that something other than um, natural selection and mutation are the explanation. So that's kind of now moving off with the third way of evolution. They're kind of like, yeah, that's not going to work. We're at least going to try something else. So um, I'm all for continued experimentation, but continued experimentation actually does lead to testable predictions on, on what we would expect. And so I'm just going to, I just, while we're talking, this is so great talking to you, Sai, because you're so interested in my nerd stuff that I normally will just put everyone to sleep. And like in my debate, I thought everyone was just so eager to just write me off and not listen anymore because I was being starting to get too technical. You're the one person that said, oh, we have to talk. And we're like, that's a really great reaction when I start to nerd out. So I'm going to throw out one other thing uh, that I think is important because it's been circulated in our in the ID community and it's also in the evolutionary, the third way. So this is really one of the rare instances where it's like, their interest in this. It's non-DNA inheritance. And um, there's several levels of it. It's not what we would call epigenetic. That's, you know, for me, epigenetics means chromatin modifications. So the non-DNA inheritance is one is the uh, glycoglycans or glyco, the sugar code. And and uh, why don't you say something about that? And then the uh, and then we'll talk. The other one is cortical, where there's organelle membrane inheritance. So I'm just throwing out some other stuff, and I figure you'd be interested. Yeah, I've heard of the sugar code, but I know almost nothing about it because this this all developed, you know, well after I retired. So I I you'd have to t tell us more about that. Okay, so this anyone can look up the sugar code. <clears throat> One of the problems with uh, it's not like DNA that's linear. I mean, somewhat linear, and you can you can read it with sugars. You have it. You need a specialized, different machine to read uh, each because they're all it's three dimensional shapes. But uh, sugars can contain three times more information than the DNA. And so there's been questions. It's like, well, where does all the developmental information come from? So we could have the same, uh, you can kind of see it that every cell has the same DNA, but uh, I mean, in the human it has the same DNA, but it can express in so many different ways. And I remember when I was asking, where, where, how does the DNA know how to have all these post-translational, I mean, all these, um, chromatin modifications, like when I was seeing these things of these embryos develop, and my professors at the NIH were some of the researchers into the histone code, and so I said, where does it all do that? And they said, no one knows. Where's the information stored? So uh, there, it's been very hard to kind of dig into that, but we know that the glycans the heritable information is not stored in the DNA. It's in the prior cell, in 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 the sugars. So the the however the sugar code does its thing, uh, it, it transcends the DNA. So the DNA helps make the sugars, but some of the the actual state of the the sugar system is is heritable outside of the DNA, and so that's kind of another wild frontier. The other thing is what they call membrane inheritance, uh, th that the uh, the contents of the, the way we duplicate the membrane is kind of like a, um, uh, you're just kind of cloning the membrane. And the membrane also has a lot of information. So uh, I think in the next 50 years, uh, our understanding of what actually is heritable is going to be pretty radically changed as we have more technology to un 
uncoil this. Uh, we've been looking at, you know, DNA only controls the, uh, is, is, is basically a, a, a template for making proteins, but there's so much in the cell that is not proteins. And how that is conveyed from one generation to another uh, is, is not controlled in the DNA. One way that we were able to establish it was experimentally. They had, um, they're modifying, oh, probably the classic example was the cilia. Um, Gary Felsenfeld at the NIH cited this uh, experiment where they, they changed the polarity of the cilia in one creature. So it's in, he wrote a big essay on epigenetics and he cited that. He said every generation after they changed the polarity had the polarity changed. It, so it transcended uh, the DNA and it started to raise questions of, well, what else can we flip? And it's going to be transgenerationally, transgenerationally inherited and probably never changed. No DNA mutation is going to change it. And then we started doing experiments like with the Golgi and other things. And I was, my jaw was starting to drop. And now we're starting to barely touch on um, variations in the human sugar code between individuals. I don't know it's gotten to the point whether we can detect whether it's connected to any disease, but we're starting to probe all these other realms. So when we talk about the incompleteness of biology, it's going to be even more incomplete. But for me, it's just exciting to see how beautiful and intricate this is. So, uh, you know, the saying is fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, and for me as an engineer, this is like so cool because it's just like all these gizmos we're discovering. You know, I haven't looked into that, but yeah, it opens a whole nother world. I mean, that's the thing about biology. It never ends. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, it's almost scary. <laughs> I, I, I might write a essay and send it to you when I'm done yeah. with it on that topic. Can I bring yeah, up here. another topic that we didn't really discuss um, before, but it was mentioned in the debate. So, yeah. Sai, you talked about how the, the, the leap how do we get from prokaryote to eukaryote? That's, you know, just something we have no idea about. How how do we get from unicellular to multicellular? But there was another thing that Sal said in the debate that, um, you know, is the the problem of there is no common ancestor for the, these proteins. And so if we think about just one type of protein which is topoisomerase. And we're not, we can, we're going to put all the other proteins aside. They also don't have a common ancestor, but the topoisomerase is, it exists in all the organisms of life that we know of. Basically there, there may be exceptions, but it's in all these organisms. There are like topoisomerase, which is doing the same function, right? It's like a little scissors that's cutting and then repairing the DNA, letting the strands out, you know, letting the coils out and then putting it back together. And the, the mechanism there the, that does that is sort of the same, it's the same in the organisms, but th this would have had to evolve. This same thing would have had to evolve like many times within organisms. I think Sally, the paper you cited said six different times where this same type of protein would have had to evolve because the sequence that produces it is so different. Um, but it somehow produced this same thing. So, you know, there's this issue of common ancestry. It, the whole idea of common ancestry is the reason that we know that we came from a common ancestor, supposedly, is the similarities between us. But what about when there's a huge difference where these weren't this wasn't common ancestry, but it, there's a common function, but not a common ancestry. So you want me to try to answer that? Because I, I, yeah. I, I know I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding, I mean, the, the, if the idea of common ancestry would be for any function, let's say an enzyme that catalyzes some metabolic reaction or the topoisomerase in this case, or any other, um, any other enzyme, that if you look at a common ancestor of two species, so for example, if you look at human and chimp, they're, 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 they have, 
the idea is they have a common ancestor and that common ancestor had one of these, one type of this enzyme protein. And there may have been some divergence, not always, but there could be divergence as you go to human and chimps, they may not be identical. In fact, they're probably not going to be identical. And as you go further back and you look at the common ancestor of all the primates, you'll find more divergence. Okay. But so in other words, if you go back to the beginning, you may have a, a ancestral protein, which then changes uh, with time. Now, the, pro the issue is that some proteins <clears throat> don't change at all. Cytochrome C has not has not evolved in in any to almost any degree it's almost exactly the same in humans as it is in uh you know plants and in bacteria and all animals uh and then there are areas of proteins that can't change because if they do they destroy the activity uh and then there are some uh genes some enzymes and genes like the hox genes which control uh gene regulation they are absolutely uh, fixed. They don't change at all. You can take a, a human Hox gene, what Sal was talking about before, and you can put it, that one you can put into a yeast. Well, uh, you were saying that it works in yeast, but you could take it from yeast and put it into a mouse and it will work because it's not been changes from yeast to mice. So that so it's very variable, and sometimes you you see lots of differences in protein sequences that do the same thing, and sometimes you see the same depending on what the protein is. Uh, so I don't see why that would be against common ancestry. You, you you don't start. I mean, common ancestry if it were completely uh, uniform would indicate that the further back you go, the more different, or, or the further, it's, it's just like you with your relations. So you would expect you and your siblings to have a lot of things in common, a little less with your cousins, even less with your second cousins, et cetera, because the common ancestor is either your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-great, et cetera. As you go further back, there are more changes in any particular, you know, protein you look at. And if you, extra if you extrapolate that to organisms, you get the same, you get the same general pattern. Now, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not yeah. addressing what you're saying. I, because that Well, maybe Sal can do a better job explaining, but I want to try one more time to kind of, Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to learn how to explain this as I understand it. And then Sal can correct me if I'm not understanding it properly. But the issue is that, you know, all, all life seems to need topoisomerase, yeah. but it, the, the topoisomerase, first of all, if, if we could imagine it evolving, right. It would have to do so incredibly quickly because you don't have time before the creature dies, right? So it has to somehow emerge like very quickly and 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 be able to, um, you know, because even in the simplest life forms, it's there. Now, but the problem is that like if you think about the chances of this occurring even once for topoisomerase to evolve one time, that would be already incredibly difficult, right? Implausible, first of all. But then you've got to have it separate times. They're saying this is, you know, how they invoke convergent evolution whenever they can't, like they say, okay, wherever an eye, we can't track it back to an ancestor. Then we say, okay, well, this is convergent evolution. So eyes evolved so many different times. Wings evolved so many different times which I think is a preposterous idea because this is already an event that must happen. But when it comes down even to the protein level, there is a problem if we're saying we have all one common ancestor, but then the topoisomerase itself is different. So the way that Sal was saying it in the debate is he was saying, look, because of there's no protein common ancestor, and, and so I'm just 
picking on Topoi Samaris. Okay, so but there was Topoi okay, Samaris, we didn't have a heritage of other proteins evolving okay. from other proteins. So okay. there have to be separate ancestry for these proteins. All right. So there was And that was means the, miracles. That's why Sal was putting it that it would we we have to have miracles for that. The first thing I said, even Dr. Dan would agree with me. Okay, here it is. Uh, so let me share my screen and rather than this is why I love doing PowerPoints because uh, when we can visualize something. So what I said, and this was from my presentation at Liberty University, by the way. So, so this is kind of the common ancestor viewpoint. Um, Dr. Joel Duff and Ken Ham actually take credit for this diagram and then I modified it. You have like a single prokaryotic like ancestor and then it diversifies into all the creatures you know present day prokaryotes and then all these eukaryotes here so i'm just going to accept that as a in my debate i said i'm just going to accept that for the sake of argument so we're on the same page but what i said is that doesn't work for the parts the protein parts of life so uh, i'm just going to read the names of the this is the um this is a zinc finger protein, a uh, tetram uh, tetrameric ion channel, homohexameric helicase, topoisomerase collagen, and insulin receptor. And, and, and then it's really evident when we go to the spelling, but doc, uh, Dr. Dan and I agreed that these would have independent origins. And we would say it's from different lo loci in the genome. Um, that's just kind of a technicality there. So uh, not only they, are they different in shape, but I, let me see if I could find an example. Uh, on the left is the collagen, and I highlighted in red all the glycine residues. And it just has this, it's just the beautiful, I, I mean, visually you could see it has a different structure than the zinc finger on the right. The zinc finger that you have the, the, the cysteines and the histidines, and when I highlight it, it's just like, yeah, these have very different architectures. And I said, Dr. Dan, um, to me, it doesn't seem this can resolve to a common ancestor. And he agreed. So, uh, um, Cy, si, I'll, I'll let you uh, comment on this slide. No, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and what you're saying, it, that's another mystery, by the way, in Origin of Life, is that uh, we cannot go back when we get to Luca there already are, based on this kind of data, uh, there already are a suite of proteins and you can't go back any further than that. We don't know where they came from, right? So that's this is all true. Uh, and, and most people will say, well, that's an origin of life issue. But it's a big origin of life issue because we don't have a common ancestor for, for most for different proteins. That's the point, right? Is yes, that, is, and, and then yeah. even for like what we call the later, you know, the, the, the more recent protein architectures like the zinc finger. Right. Uh, the eukaryotic zinc finger, we actually found that prokaryotes have them too, which is a big discovery. Um, it, these almost just like come out of nowhere. And then even the collagen architecture, uh, people say, well, that's really easy to make a repeat. And I say, when you actually study the collagen, it's way more complicated than that. Um, this is uh, uh, all the all the uh, you know post translational modification that has to happen to make this work. It just makes the jaw drop. Um, but what Rebecca was referring to, in addition to that, in addition to this, that there are no universal common ancestor for the major protein families. Um, now, what I think you were referring to, and I think I had a diagram to that effect. Um, so this is an example of where we have a zinc finger for humans and a zinc finger for pigs. Uh, and it's the same one, the zinc finger 136. And, and you could see that they're very similar. And this is how they diverge over time. And that's where we were referring to that the, the protein would look this, you know, roughly the same in the, in across species, we call those homologs. But the problem is like what we were talking, what Rebecca was referring to was way back when I said that um, 
this is the problem that we deal with. So uh, within that particular homolog, it looks like it looks very much like common descent. But then we're confronted with the mystery of the origin of major protein families that don't have, they would look like they have independent ancestry of the, the, the major form. But what Rebecca added to that was that like in the topoi somrace family, or actually any number of proteins, especially in bacteria, even if they have the same fold and function, they may have a totally different spelling. And Change Tan, Rob Stadler's co-author, was one who did research in that, just looking at papers that had studied that. And they'd said, well, um, this looks like it had independent origins. So I was, uh, one example are serine proteases. You can have the same shape, but they may have such different uh, spellings, uh, you know, such different spellings like this that they start postulating independent origins. And we, we're seeing the same with the topoisomerases. So this was a diagram where they're trying to do the phylogeny of topoisomerases, and it doesn't look like a tree. And so Joe DeWeese and I actually uh, wrote an article, a creationist article, and we referenced this one, and we just started laughing because this talked about the independent ancestry. And again, it's the sequence. The sequences are so different, but yet the functions are similar and even the shapes just kind of like what I was talking about with the protein uh, serine proteases. But there's an interesting quote in this article. Uh, so this was in uh, a great, a good journal, Nucleic Acids Research, the phylogenomic of, uh, of DNA topoisomerase is their origin and putative roles in the emergence of modern organisms. But there's this funny quote here. They're talking about Luca and it just made me laugh. Uh, so, uh, the last universal common ancestor, which is usually assumed to contain a genome. An intelligent designer would have probably invented only one ubiquitous topo one and one ubiquitous topo two to facilitate the tasks, the task of future biochemists. <laughs> oh, you can unmute. He muted himself, so I can't unmute him. He has to unmute I'm him. just laughing, that is very funny. And, and 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 so they're just saying it's just not you know the task is too difficult because we can't make a single tree and then because and then and then their diagram way down here shows like when they're trying to make the tree it ended up looking like that <laughs> right and so they're just saying this is they said the intelligent designer wouldn't have made our task so hard <laughs> right would have had mercy yeah, have mercy, intelligent designer, have mercy. Um, so Change Tan, I mean, going back to the science, she was pointing out, she found, I was asking her, I said, okay. Uh, so I, I asked her, I said, do you have any, do you have any sequence homology among, um, um, how about among polymerases? She said, wait, you know, polymerases are made of subunits. I said, okay, what about the subunit? She said, no. Um, there's no sequence, there's no absolute sequence homology. Uh, and we have all these different implementations and radically different spellings. And so this is actually something that it's also valuable for creationists to know, because I tell them there's not just one way to make a protein of the same function. There are many ways. So try to throw out some of your probability arguments. You have to reframe them. There. See, I got a thumbs up from Sai. You should have seen that, Rebecca. Yeah, I mean, some of the probability arguments are just, they don't work very well. So I, I like well, to tell people. What sometimes about the they're good, sometimes they're not very good. You know, the probability arguments. Because, yeah, what, what Sal just said is true. There, there's more than one way to make a polymerase. I mean, there's you know, and, and that, by the way, this great work by Andreas Wagner on that, he talks about robustness and the possibility of moving around in, in, in a sequence space without destroying your function. And then all of a sudden you get a whole new function because, you know, you've been able to modify greatly. So um, there, there's some very interesting work on that. And, and I think that the, uh, the, 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 
lack of homologies between, you know, in, in specific enzyme families is very interesting. I don't think it's a, it's a killer for evolution. I just think it, you know, it's something that needs to be explained. But the really hard part is where did it all come from? Where did it all start? How did we get, how did we get this suite of whatever it is, you know, several hundred uh, essential proteins, all of which are working? We don't have common ancestry of proteins. That's true. Uh, and th it, it, it appears, in fact, uh, well, it's also related to something called orphan genes, which are genes that appear in some species with no homologue and no clear understanding of where they came from. So there are new genes that, that are often produced because of modifications of old, uh, dead uh, pseudogenes. But there are also new genes that just seem to come out of nowhere. And that's totally not understood how that could possibly happen. Uh, but there are many examples of those. And um, the question of where, how did the original cell come up with this suite of something like, I think the estimate is something like 150 or somewhere a little bit over 100, the numbers vary. You gotta have a minimal set of proteins to have life. That's a minimal set of enzymes and, and other structural proteins. You can't have less than that number. And where do they come from? Because <laughs> you know that they, they, they didn't evolve. And, and that's a mystery. That is a mystery. Nobody knows, you know, where that, what the answer is to that. Was there one, was there one or five or 10 original proteins that came by random and then they evolved? No, there's no evidence for that. Sai, you said you're going to hold on to your evolution. Why? Okay, I still think that evolution by natural selection explains a great deal of biology, of bio biological diversity. Um, my, as I said, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong. I think that, I mean, it again. I think the analogy with physics is very good. When Einstein discovered relativity, and uh, you know, Bohr and Planck and all the others discovered quantum theory. They didn't throw away Newtonian physics. That still works. It still it still explains, you know, how large objects move and, and everything else. And so what they did was they, they came up with new theories to explain the very small world, which was not explainable by new, Newtonian physics. So I I think that if we assuming we do eventually get a comprehensive biological theory. It's not going to disprove evolution at all, but it will add to it and fill in the gaps uh, and perhaps strengthen it in some way, as, as some of the new data that we've been talking about has already done. Uh, but it's not going to, dis it's not going to, I don't think it's going to say, well, evolution is wrong. There was no common ancestry. There's no common descent. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, that's, there's definitely there's so much evidence for that from genetic sequences, from fossils, from all kinds of different sources. You know, I, I think it's pretty well established, and what it needs is addition. It doesn't replacement. That's my view. You know, so I, I'm not like some of my young Earth creationist colleagues. It's like there's just they generate so much animosity. I'd come from secular training i was a theistic evolutionist old earth creationist young earth there's some that are just you know very very dog dogmatic and doctrinaire and i'm just like you know guys chill you know it's not a hill to die on and it's not cause for us to um, be at each other's throats uh, but there is one thing that has always bothered me is the similarity and progression of forms in the fossil record and definitely I've been trying to tell creationists, I said, you're not going to run away from the fact we look like we're descended from a common ancestor from, for the simple reason that you can group organisms into groups and it's like a family relation. I mean, even like when I look at people, it's like I could say, I think that group's more closely related than another group. And in that you get this impression of common ancestry. 
So the way that I have answered that, and I'm just going to point this out, uh, because we see the progression of forms, one of the ways that I have dealt with that is I said, well, you know, we look at a pencil, we could argue that it's bent, but it's actually not. And way back before Copernicus, et cetera, we thought the earth was the center of the universe because the data points all agreed with it. And so Stephen Gould uh, posed this question, why would God, let's see if I could, if I have a, uh, there is, there was this quote by Stephen Gould. Yeah. Why did God create to mimic evolution and test our faith thereby? Because we do, when we look at, all of the diversity and similarity of organisms. It really, I've tried to tell creationists, I said, you don't know how strongly it looks evolved. When you actually study this, you do gene browsing, you see the, you know, I looked at, I've seen the pseudogenes uh, between humans and chimps and the primates. I'm just like, yeah, you, when you get there, it's like, this is a very strong case. And the same with the ERBs. I said, guys, you can't minimize what you're, you're dealing with. And, I have said that maybe we're just looking at it like, you know, we could look at it in one way and say our data set says that the pencil is bent or that the earth is geocentric. And I put in my debate, they said, well, look at all the testable predictions that evolution makes. And I said, well, geocentrism actually made a lot of great testable predictions. The model you could, you could have, you could predict the sun rises and sets every day. They are able to do, uh, Eclipses even under a geocentric model, which I just think is spectacular. But I said it doesn't just because you have the confirmation of the model in these kind of affirmative tests doesn't mean that it's right. It actually got overturned because there were anomalies that broke it that were inconsistent. And so for me, um, these 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 difficulties like with the uh, like the orphan genes, these independent protein families. Uh, and all the complexity of the coordination needed, that, that said, I think, well, I think it's, it leans me toward a miracle, but then you have this appearance of evolution. So I tried to tell the creationists, I said, I think the appearance of evolution is very compelling, but I would classify it on the order of this bent pencil, which was resolved by Snell's law, and then geocentrism, which was resolved by heliocentrism. So then the question came up, and this has happened to me when I was at the NIH, why would God make this? And I said, I think the progression of forms is, let's see, it's best explained that God made these creatures. So Marshall Nirenberg, and there's at the NIH, they had the Nirenberg lecture because he won the Nobel Prize to figure out how, uh, how the, the genetic code and I said it was easier to do that because we had bacteria. So I have said that um, all these other creatures are to help us to understand ourselves. And it really came to the point when I said, how do we do stuff at the NIH to learn human biology? We have to use model organisms. So this is like a, a dissection of a fetal pig here, but isn't it so much better we can dissect pigs and fetuses of pigs rather than humans? And I, that really began to echo in me then why we have this appearance of progression of evolutionary forms. But there are now papers that Joe DeWeese and I are working on. I don't know if I have it here. Well, here it is. So one thing that we are able to do now with AlphaFold and particularly this thing called DCA, it's a computation. We can take the sequence differences between uh, humans, and zebrafish, and then other creatures, if we do a multiple sequence alignment, we can put it through this ugly computation, and I'll show it to you, and then we can predict the fold. And I said, that's like voodoo. There's no reason that biology should have these forms of similarity and diversity so it's th that basically gives you a 3D coordinate system so that we could take the sequences like here, and we have a whole bunch of them. We put it through a computation like that, and then we can get the 3D fold. We don't have to do X-ray crystallography to make these determinations. And I said, that's, to me, it's like, okay, that's starting to explain why we would have a nested hierarchy 
uh, that nested hierarchy in the proteins that looks like it's evolved actually makes feasible scientific discovery. So it seems to me that biology, my theory of biology is why does it look the way it does? Why does it look evolved? And yet I, I'm a creationist. And my answer finally, and this has only been like in the last five years personally, it is designed that way to optimize scientific discovery. So that's my theory of biology. It's designed for science, it's optimized for scientific discovery. And um, I, I, I use that as my overriding paradigm. This is going to lead to testable hypotheses, by the way, with medical significance that uh, uh, there might be answers to our questions of how biology actually works. If we look at other creatures, each creature has a piece of the puzzle to help us understand how our own biology works. And I said, that's just as good. Whether you're a creationist or not, if we go with the idea that this is designed uh, fine tuned for us to do science, that the pieces of the puzzle of how our biology, as we're trying to solve problems with medical science, there are pieces of it that we can find all over. We have to look at all the other creatures, they're pieces of the puzzle. So that's my answer. That's my theory. Well, my answer is different. My answer is, it's not God's fault you guys came up with this stupid evolution idea. Yeah. And now you want now you want him to rearrange everything like just to like not look like your theory. Like I like it's not God's fault we came up with this. It makes sense that he used similarities. I mean, we all live in the same environment. We have the same types of, you know, in general life has the same types of needs. You know, and so it, it makes sense that we're similar. So I don't know. That's my that's my answer. So I'll just say that was very interesting. Um, what you just said about your theory. Um, I never heard that before. And I have to think about it. It's very interesting. It's amazing. Yeah. And I wanted to thank you, Rebecca, for hosting this talk. Because it originally was just me and Cy. But I said, I think Rebecca would love to be in this conversation and and you take it's it some great idea from, yeah i know thank you for inviting me it was really fun and um you know you guys are two of my favorite scientists so it's fun to get to to you know hear you share ideas all right i see we've gone well over two hours and i know rebecca you have no time limit on how far you can go but uh, <laughs> i'm an old yeah. guy so I'm, I'm about done okay guys okay nice talking with you take okay. care Sarah. thanks god bless you all. Touch, god bless Alrighty. you bye-bye bye-bye